Um, so we're looking at this um, incredible passage here in Hebrews chapter 10. And uh, the book of Hebrews has been explaining that the sacrificial system throughout the Old Testament and the elaborate purification rites that we see uh, in the Old Testament are simply a preview of what's to come. They're actually pointing towards Jesus Christ. Uh, they point to the message of the gospel or the new covenant that is to come. Now, the old sacrificial system uh, under the law of Moses was only a shadow, we're told in Hebrews. It was a dim preview of the good things to come, the new covenant to come. And the sacrifices under, this, uh, under that system were repeated again and again and again, year after year. They were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. People would sacrifice animals as a way of, um, uh, of repenting and having their sins cleansed. But they had to continually keep doing that all the time. Uh, verse 2 uh, and 4, uh, we, we read, If they could have provided, i.e. The, sacrifice, sacrifice, uh, the sacrifices and the system that was in place, if they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped. For the worshippers would have been purified once for all and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So the problem with the old system, the sacrifices and the cleansing rituals, was that you had to keep doing them over and over again. They were a temporary fix. The old sacrificial system reminded people of their inadequacy and of their sinfulness. And deep down inside everyone, they understood that it was impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to actually take away the sinful nature that runs so deep inside of each one of us. And today, there are still many people many Christians even, who continue to live according to the old system. They think that they, they, they have to do good works, hoping that they will balance out the bad stuff in their lives. And deep down, they know that they don't measure up to God's standards. Every time they read the Bible, or every time they go to church, they come away thinking the same thing. They have to try harder in order to gain salvation, or they have to try harder in order to gain a relationship with God. They're not good enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. How can I be good enough? I'll do more of this. I'll do more of that. And some are so aware of their failures and sin that they actually give up in their pursuit of a relationship with God. What's the use in going to church? What's the use in reading the Bible? What's the use in trying to live by godly standard. I'm just not up to it. I'm just not up to it. I'm just not good enough. And if that's, if that's where you find yourself this morning, then you're absolutely right. <laughs> you're not good enough. You're spot on. None of us are good enough. The Bible says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us doesn't measure up. And no matter how hard we try, we never can and never will. We never, we can't measure up. But here's the good news of the new covenant. In Christ, you are good enough. In Christ, you are good enough. And the message of the gospel is a message that says, Jesus paid for your sin and for mine, so that when God the Father looks upon me and when God the Father looks upon you, he doesn't see the sinful rags of Mike Pavlou before him, but instead what he sees are the clothes of righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. That's what he looks upon when he looks upon me and when he looks upon you, if you've embraced Christ as your Lord and Savior. And that makes you and that makes me Good enough. We don't have to be anything else. So friends, if you've embraced Christ as your Lord and Savior this morning, your salvation is secured. It is a done deal. 
You don't have to keep striving to be good enough. You're there in that regard. There's nothing more for us to do in that regard. Christ has done it for us. It's interesting, in the passage that we read, I think I'm right in saying this, I should have looked it up properly before I came, but in the temple, um, maybe in particular parts where the priests were and whatever, there were no seats, no chairs, because their work was never finished. They were continually having to be doing work in the temple. But in the passage we just read, uh, we read that Christ sat, sat down at the right hand of God in heaven. Why did he sit down? Because there was no more work to do in regards to salvation. The job was done. It was completed. So he sat down. Christ has done it for us. Your salvation is secured. But not only that, you're not just uh, saved and then you're just left to get on with it. Christ, when you become a Christian, when you embrace Christ as your Lord and Savior, Christ through his Holy Spirit comes to live, to reside in you. You carry the very presence of God in you. The presence of Jesus Christ lives in you. The invis his invisible presence, if you like, the Holy Spirit. The mo that happens the moment you, you give your life to him. And that Holy Spirit then empowers you to also begin to overcome the sinful nature that runs so deep inside of each one of us. And it begins the process, the Holy Spirit then begins the process of making you more Christ-like, more holy. That's why this is good news. That's why we say the good news of Jesus Christ. You're saved, you're justified, but then God comes by his Holy Spirit to, that's not the end of the story, begins to make you and shape you more into the likeness of um, uh, of Jesus Christ. And the Bible calls these two things justification and sanctification. The process of making you more Christ-like, more holy. And Hebrews chapter 10 highlights these two incredible benefits uh, from, the New Test uh, from the New Covenant. And I want to focus very briefly, I mean, you could have a, a, a sermon series on each one of them, but I just want to focus very briefly on these two this morning. Justification and sanctification from this passage that we've just read. First of all, justification. Verses 17 and 18, we read, Then he says, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. What an incredible promise that is. When you put your trust in Jesus Christ, you are justified, you're declared right, you're free to go, all the charges against you are dropped, your sins are forgiven, the charges are dropped, and God will not remember your sin or rebellion anymore. It's as though it never was, as though it never happened. Those things that haunt you, those things that you don't want to share with anyone, those actions you wish you could erase from your memory and your life, they're forgiven. They're dealt with. They are no longer issues before God. Our slate is wiped clean. That's justification. And when we're told that God doesn't remember, it's not as if God, it's not that God actually literally forgets those things. It means that God doesn't, uh, God doesn't suffer a lapse of memory in the way that we might sometimes. What it means is that our sin is forgotten in the sense that it is no longer an issue for God. It is no longer a barrier that hinders our relationship with him. It's been torn down before it was your sin that separated you from God. It's the one thing that God can't do, have anything to do with sin cannot have it in his presence. So that was a barrier between you and him, preventing you from a relationship. But Jesus Christ has now dealt with that sin, uh, that barrier of sin. He took it for you on the cross. So that barrier has been erased. It is no longer there. So it's not that God forgets. It is not an issue anymore. It doesn't exist because Jesus has dealt with it. Um, but the problem is, that some of us, although God has erased it, it's no longer an issue for him. The problem for, 
fact is, for some of us, it continues to be a problem. God has let it go, but we refuse to do so. And we continually keep bringing it back and feel the shame and the guilt that's been attached to a sin that's already been forgiven and that we've been cleansed for. And there's this wonderful example by Cory Ten Boom, who says, um, God takes your sin and mine and pushes it, buries it in the deepest, deepest heart of the depths, the deepest point in the sea, and pushes it there, and then he puts a sign above it saying, no fishing. <laughs> no fishing. And the problem is, some of us go fishing and bringing it back up again, as though, it, as though it's still there. Let it go. It's been dealt with. It's almost, it's almost as though you're throwing stuff back in, in, in the face of Jesus Christ, saying, well, it wasn't good enough what you do. What you do. I'm bringing it back up. Let it go. No fishing. Leave it. It's been dealt with. Justification. That is what God does with our sin. In the past, in the present, and remarkably, even our sin in the future, the sin that you've yet to commit, he buries it in the deepest depths of the deepest ocean. And then he puts a sign up saying, no fishing. That's justification, just very, very briefly. Um, and sanctification is the next thing I want to touch on, which is the, uh, this, uh, this uh, second benefit of the work of, uh, of Christ. In verse, uh, and in verse 10 we read, For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Not only are we justified, our wrongdoing, our sin is taken care of, but God by his Holy Spirit that now resides inside of you begins the work of sanctification. That is, making you more like Jesus, making you more holy. And to be holy means to be set apart for God's purpose. In other words, we become a person who lives to the glory of God in the way that Jesus did. It is to be a person who lives uh, who lives God's way, just like Jesus did. So the benefit of this new covenant, this new agreement, that's what covenant means, is that when you become a Christian, two things happen. First, something happens to you. Something happens to you. You are declared righteous or innocent by virtue of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That happens to you. You're declared not guilty, and that's called justification. Second, there is something that happens in you. God not only forgives our sin, but he also begins to change our moral base, our moral compass. And when we become a follower of Jesus Christ, we're told that, no, that, that sin no longer has power over us. Sin no longer has power over us. What does that mean? Well, before, uh, before we became a follower of Jesus, sin had a hold on us. We were like enslaved by it. It was more powerful than we were, but in Christ, that power has been broken. The addiction is removed. And consequently, we begin to walk in a new direction now, in the direction of becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. That's called sanctification. And you say, yeah, that's all well and good, Mike. But if that's true, I have to say to you, I don't really feel really very holy, actually. I don't really feel very Christ-like. And anyway, if that's true, why is it then that I still struggle so much with my old sinful nature? Why is it that I still struggle with sins that I, that I used to be uh, used to a battle with before I was a, a Christian. Why is that then? Does it mean that I'm not really a Christian? It really bothers me. Well, anything new takes time to adapt to, doesn't it? If it's something new, you don't adapt to it straight away. Change takes time. You are a new person in Christ, but at the same time, you work at being more Christ-like. And the reason that sin bothers you now is because you are a new creation. <laughs> sin never used to bother you before. Why, is it, why does it bother you now? 
Why does it bother you now? It is because, it, uh, the fact that sin bothers you now in a way that it never used to before is a hallmark of genuine conversion, is a hallmark of the new person that you now are, but the person that you need to begin to get used to being, if that makes sense. Verse 14 says, For by that one offering he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. Notice that we are made perfect, but we're also being made holy. We are all work in, pro in process. You've been saved, so in that regard, when God looks at you on that final day, he will see you as perfect and holy. He will see the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's a done deal. But in the meantime, in this life, we continue the process of being more Christ-like. We're considered holy in God's eyes, but living out that holiness is a lifelong process. An example that may help you with that, and just grasping that, in it, which helped me. Imagine if you're, you're, um, you've worked for a company for th uh, 30, 20, 40 years, however it may be, and John is your boss, and every day you report to John, and John tells you what you've got, what you've got to do for that day. You've got to bill, you've got to do this, 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 and this, get on with it. And you get on, and when you've finished it, you go back to John, and John gives you, says to right, you've got to do this, this, and this, and this uh, today. And you do exactly what John says, because he's your boss, and he's in charge of you. Uh, and there's no way around that. And then the managing director comes to you, and he says, uh, Bill, uh, we've noticed that you've been doing really well um, uh, lately, and we're going to promote you, and we're going to put you, uh, actually, you're now going to be in charge over John and his department. So you're now, you're going to be the boss now over John. So, and that starts with immediate effect. So tomorrow morning, you don't need to report to John anymore. You just go up into the office above you, and then John will have to come and report to you, and whatever. So you come in that the next day, but for 20, 30, 40 years, you've been reporting to John. So instinctively, as you walk in, what do you do? You go in, and you report to John, even though you've now been promoted and you're his boss. So you report to John, and John, um, uh, he's just as bad as you. He's incurable, because for 20, 30, 40 years, all, he's been telling you what to do. So he starts laying out your agenda for the day, and off you go. And after about a month, the managing director calls you in, and he says, Bill, we've noticed that you're still reporting into John every day. Did you not understand that we've promoted you and now you have authority over John and not the other way around. Get used to it and get on with it and you start telling John what to do. And it's a little bit like that with our old self, the old sinful nature. You are a new creation, but at the same time, the old sin sinful nature calls on you and you feel that you have to report back to it. Well, actually, you don't anymore because you have an, you're a new person in Christ and you have the authority now to be able to tell the old nature no. It doesn't mean that you're not going to be tempted. It doesn't mean that you're not going to slip up from time to time. What it does mean is that it no longer has to have the hold on you that it once used to. It doesn't have to be that way anymore now. You have a power and an authority, maybe not overnight, but over a period of time, to deal. There's some things in my, in, in my life now, still now, after decades of being a Christian, that I still struggle with, and I still say to the Lord, Lord, give me strength, continue to give me strength. Lord, help me to see and despise this sin in the way that you see it. It's a lifelong process, sanctification. But the key is you have authority over the old nature now. It no longer has authority over you. So get on with it and start exercising that authority. You have a new boss who has given you authority over your previous boss. And it will take time to get used to the idea that we no longer have to respond to the orders of our previous boss. And as, as we get used to... Uh, to doing that, there will, be, there will be a noticeable change in our daily lives. 
The process of sanctification, being made holy, being made more Christ-like, is a progress uh, that we should be able to track through the course of our lives. And you and I uh, should be able to look back over a stretch of five, ten years or so, and as we look back, we will see that there has been progress in our Christian walk. And you may not yet be the person that you long to be as a Christian. You may not be the Christian or the person that you want to be. But as you look back, by the same, uh, by the same token, you're no longer the person you used to be either. You're not. And as you look back, you'll be able to track that. Our values, our habits, our relationships with others and the things we desire will begin to change. Some things quicker than others, other things will take a lot longer. But there will be a noticeable change. And the good news is, the new covenant um, means sanctification is something that begins when we put our trust in Jesus Christ as Saviour and it ends when we finally get completely free of our sinful nature when and only then on that final day, we stand before the Lord in heaven. And then we will be completely free from our sinful nature. Sin will be no more. It will be eradicated. It doesn't exist in heaven. The battle with sin will be over. But in the meantime, make no mistake, the battle with sin will continue. But it doesn't mean that you're not a Christian, and it doesn't mean that you're not a new creation. But in saying that, a little footnote, in saying that, people make progress in sanctification at different rates. How quickly we progress and how far we grow in becoming more Christ-like will depend on how well we choose to cooperate with the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's where it lies with us. We can choose how much or how little we co cooperate with the Holy Spirit in our lives. So we can choose to grow in holiness or not remain stagnant. And often, I don't know about you, but often I look at um, uh, really uh, godly men and women, uh, past, in the past and in the present, and I think, wow, I wish I could be as godly uh, as these people. I wish I had their faith. I wish I could just, they radiate Christ. I wish I could be that godly and that and, and, and as Christ-like as these wonderful saints. Well, here's the thing. Godly men and women don't just happen. <laughs> they don't just happen. If you look, any uh, great uh, man or woman of God, behind that you will see a man or a woman of prayer, a man or a woman who loves the Bible, a man or a woman who is sacrificially obedient to God. And all of these things involve choice. So you don't just become a wonderful, godly man or woman. It involves a choice and it involves a decision to allow the Holy Spirit to direct you and you obediently follow that. So a good question to ask ourselves could be this, for this week and, 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 and in the weeks to come. What can I do to facilitate the process of sanctification in my life? What can I do to facilitate me becoming more Christ-like in my life? And the remainder of Hebrews uh, focuses on what we, can, what we can and should be doing to facilitate practical holiness. Uh, these are not instructions. Uh, it's important to know here. These are not instructions on what to do to gain forgiveness. Jesus has taken care of that. You're saved. You cannot, be, you, cannot, you cannot not be a child of God once you are a child of God. Any more than uh, if you're a parent, your child can never be, there can never come a time when your child cannot be your child and you cannot be their parents. The relationship might suffer, but they can never not be your child and you can never not be their parent. Um, so... Um, the rest of Hebrews is not an instruction on forgiveness. Is Jesus taking care of that? And th these are instructions on t how to live as one who is forgiven. How to live as somebody who is forgiven. And a simple rule of thumb uh, for growing in holiness 
uh, is this. It can be summed up in this. Read the Bible and do what it says. <laughs> really, it's that simple. <laughs> Read the Bible and do what it says. Do it not because you're trying to score points with God. Do it because you have come to recognize that living God's way is the very best way for you to live. It may be difficult, and it may be sacrificial, but ultimately, living God's way is the very best way to live. And you recognize that. And that's why you choose to read the Bible and do what it says. So as we conclude, I want to remind you of two things again from this new covenant in Hebrews, this new agreement. First, we're, rem we're reminded that forgiveness is not about how good we are. It's not about our efforts and good works. It is simply the grace of God, an undeserved free gift. We cannot earn forgiveness. There is, uh, and this is such a tough concept for some people to grasp. Because in our society, we're led to believe that we must earn everything we receive. It's impossible to be good enough. We cannot earn our salvation. We find forgiveness through Christ and Christ alone. And the wonderful message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that this forgiveness is available to any and to all who will put their trust in him. There is nothing you must or can do to earn salvation. It is a free gift. You simply need to receive it. And if you live your life feeling that you are so bad, God could never love you, then you need to look up at the cross of Jesus Christ and understand that the blood of Christ can cleanse anyone. Anyone. There is nobody who is beyond forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Your past can be forgiven, whatever it may have involved, involved, whatever it was you were involved in. And secondly, our focus as believers, once you've become a, a Christian, is not about getting saved. It is about it is about living saved. If that makes it. it's about living as somebody who's a child of God. Through Christ, the power of sin has been broken in your life. We now sin out of habit, not out, not out of compulsion. We no longer have to live the way that we used to. We're saved by the work of Christ, but it's up to us to work with the Holy Spirit to live out that salvation in our daily lives. And we need to remind ourselves that we are saved, nothing can change that, but we are also learning to live as somebody who is saved. And that's sanctification. Ask God daily to give you the strength to live the life he calls you to. God will do it for you. The promise is God never calls you to do or be anything that he doesn't supply the strength and the empowering to do. He does it for you. You just need to be willing. You just need to surrender and say, okay, I'm doing it. Give me the strength to do it. I can't do it myself. And he will. Determine to make choices that are not based on your desires because those desires will still be influenced by the old sinful nature, but by the instruction of God's word. What does God's word say here? Not what I feel is right or doesn't seem fair. What does God's word say here? And I'm going to choose to go with that, regardless of what my human inclination is. In other words, uh, and, you, and it's, a good, it's a good thing to ask yourself, as we've already said, what do I need to do? What do I need to change? What do I need to put in place to begin to deepen my relationship with Christ? In other words, if you want to be holy, if you want to be more like Jesus then read the Bible and aim to do what it says. Let me make you a promise. Um, I promise you, I promise, I know it'd be difficult for some of you, don't set yourselves um, uh, an unachievable target. 
uh, you may need to sort of break it down and build up to it. But I promise you that if you spend an hour every day reading your Bible, in the pre- uh, being with God, chilling out with God, giving him time, an hour every day doing that for a month, I promise you, I dare to promise you, that you'll see a transformation in your life. You will not be the same person you were a month previously. Because this, God would have saturated you with so much of his word and his presence that you will see, think, and feel differently to how you did a month ago. Read the Bible and aim to do what it says. I want to pray and hand over 